What say ye to two copper pieces? Yar, I say thee no. Or nay. <laughs> Nine. Nine. No, that's that's weird. That got weird. We're not including that joke. Come on. Okay, <laughs> fine. That might be our intro bit. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Avatar, the podcast. I am Booster Greg, and of course, I am joined by Acorn Bandit. Hello. Hello. This episode, we will be talking about the water bending scroll, or as we like to call it. Anything Katara can do and can do better. That's right. And before we dive into the episode... We just want to take a moment to thank our latest five-star review. This comes from ABUCK96 and is titled An Appa Among Pets. ABUCK writes, since Avatar came to Netflix, praise the Lord, I've been binging like a madwoman. And of course, it paved the way for many new Avatar podcasts. Praise the Lord again. Naturally, I listened to all of them to find the best one, and this is by far superior. An Appa Among Pets, if you will. I love that it is lighthearted and humorous, yet still grounded in the show we all hold dear. I will say it would be even better if y'all added audio clips from the show. Thanks and love listening to y'all. I love the (laughs) y'alls. I love it. I love it so much. It's so good. It's so passionate. Hey, Buck, thank you so much for leaving that five-star review. Again, we've said this before in the past. We'll continue to say so. If you want your five-star review read on the podcast, just write it. And rate it five stars. And it will be read. I promise you that. Or if you want to just kind of message us directly and not have all of the internet able to see the review, but still want some of it read, you can always email us at avatarthepodcast at gmail.com. We know you are bursting with thoughts and opinions. Please, we know in it. some way, share it with us. Please. You can also, if you need yet another avenue to get in contact with us. You can always tweet at us at podcast avatar. And speaking of which we do have a special shout out to Goller golf who shared their awesome avatar artwork with us. Goller golf is making a poster for each season of the show and is already two posters in. So again, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we genuinely can't wait to see what your season three poster is going to be. They did note that Toph may be their favorite character, and they were surprised they had never drawn her before. Um, I am thinking about all of the amazing characters in season three, so I especially can't wait to see what kind of composition you come up with. So thank you, Goller Golf. Thank you. We also have a special announcement. If you didn't already know, for the past three years, I've been creating enamel pins and have come up with a special avatar pin for the podcast. Ooh. Ooh. If you're a fan of the show, a fan of our podcast, or even just fans of us, please consider checking out the website and picking one up. You can visit joysons.com, which is J-O-I-S-A-N-S.com, or find it on Etsy at Joyson Studio. I will say this. I saw it because I get special privileges to see pins, like all these avatar pins before they come out. (laughs) Uh, All I'm going to say is it's super cute, and I cannot wait for everyone to see it. All right. With all that being said, let's jump right into the summary for episode eight, The Water Bending Scroll. This episode was written by John O'Brien and was directed by Anthony Liao. We rejoin Team Avatar as they are once again riding on Appa's back on their way to the Northern Water Tribe. With Avatar Roku's words echoing through Aang's head, the young airbender is riddled with anxiety and paces back and forth. He only has a few short months to become the master of fire, water, and earthbending, which, as we found out last episode, uh, can take a few years for just one of those to master alone. Katara offers to teach him what she knows about waterbending until they can reach the Northern Water Tribe, and Aang accepts the offer. Katara says that they need to find a water source to practice in, to which Sokka replies, maybe you can find a nice puddle to splash in. We cut to a large waterfall and Sokka retorts, nice puddle. (laughs) I love how there's like a, almost like a parental vibe going on where like Sokka's driving Appa. Katara's like, calm down, come here. (laughs) 
and like in a motherly way is like calm down i can teach you what you know of water bending it's it's kind of like you have like the big math test to happen and you didn't don't have the time to study and your mom's just like well i can add yeah <laughs> maybe i can help <laughs> um i do want to note too that it's nice that appa trusts Sokka enough to let him steer yes which is really really sweet because that was i would imagine that was uh, not just a trust that happened but was built up over when in um part one spirit world of the winter solstice winter solstice thank you yeah uh where he was missing and appa was not just sad that ang went missing but also Sokka did so I, I think that's like a nice compounded thing that happened yeah they're a family unit now they are it's really nice uh, appa does a belly flop into the water and ang is about to jump in after his old friend when Katara reminds Aang why they stopped at the waterfall. Sokka asks what he's supposed to do while the two of them are waterbending, to which Aang hands Sokka a stick with like a, br like a large brussel at the end of it and suggests that he cleans in between Appa's toes. Mud and bugs, please. <laughs> I love how Sokka's like, eh, all right. <laughs> he's like, he's not offended or anything. He's like, okay, it's something to do. I like my buddy Appa. Well, later on, I didn't make a note of this, but later on, we do see him like on Appa's stomach trying to like clean out his toes yes. while Appa's just like <laughs> casually drifting on the water. It's really funny. It's really sweet. Meanwhile, Zuko is sparring with a soldier when he is knocked off balance by the sudden redirection of his own ship. Zuko rushes into the bridge and demands to know about this mutiny. Iroh explains that there is no mutiny that he asked the captain to set a new course for the ship. It seems Uncle Iroh has lost his white lotus tile for his game of pie show. A piece that Iroh explains is crucial to his unusual winning strategy, since the piece is generally considered to be useless by others. Furious about the sudden change in his plan, Zuko lets out his rage in a cloud of smoke and flame through his nose and mouth, to which Iroh calmly declares that he is so lucky to have such an understanding nephew. <laughs> I want everyone to make a, a just a note of that tile piece. Uh, Greg, do, do I smell foreshadowing? I think so. I mean, I showered today, so it's not me. <laughs> yes, that is important. Pay attention to that. Also, I have a note about the uh, soldier that Zuko was sparring with. That mm -hmm. is apparently Lieutenant G. He is one of the senior officers aboard Zuko's ship, and he is a capable firebender, accomplished singer, and talented Pippa player. Good to know. And I found out a Pippa is a string in instrument, kind of like a guitar with four strings and a pear-shaped body. Um, but G will be aboard the ship for a substantial period of time, uh, during which he occasionally argues with Prince Zuko. Good. Give him, give him a taste of his own medicine. That's what I say. That <laughs> jerk. Fire Nation, firebenders, can't trust them. Uh, Says kidding. Sokka. Says Sokka. <laughs> Back at the nice puddle, I'm doing air quotation marks because I know everyone can, everyone can hear that. <laughs> Katara begins to share with Aang her knowledge of waterbending. Katara starts off with a move that took her months to get the hang of, and to her surprise, Aang picks up the first trick with ease. Katara then throws everything she knows at the Avatar, and not only does Aang get the hang of it, he immediately masters the lessons with little to no effort. A little jealous that it took her a lot longer to learn these lessons. Katara's patience begins to fade, and we actually get to see a little more of her brother shine through. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like the whole episode. I'm just like, she's getting very Sokka-ish yeah. in this. A little, a little sassy, a little yeah. bitey. Yeah. Yep. Um, I do love how she's like specifically, uh, though the over the head flare was unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I like the, <laughs> like the first point. So the first point he gets the hang of it. Right. And then she's like, wow, that took me a lot longer to like learn and figure out. And Aang being Aang responds with a, well, I have a great teacher. You didn't, you had to learn it yourself. And, and right there. Katara's like okay like she feels better about herself and then yeah. he just like soars past her essentially pun intended um, uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. 
And then she starts to feel like it's like a little insecure, a little jealous. Like she's just like, I, you have to imagine at this point, she's like, am I really a good waterbender? Or is this just like, I mm -hmm. am a waterbender. So yeah, so um, she teaches him a couple more lessons. And there's this big one that she kind of tries to teach him, which is almost making like a small tidal wave, essentially. Yeah. Um, so she shows him that and she can kind of do it, but not really. She's still getting the hang of it. And then Aang just like summons this tidal wave. And we will make another note of this. Whenever Katara water bends, somehow <laughs> Sokka gets wet. And that happens, although it's not through her own water bending, but through Aang's and his larger tidal wave that not only yeah. gets Sokka wet, but also washes away uh, all of their um, supplies, their rations, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, all the stuff that they got from Senlin Village. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, poor Sokka. He's like, my life is hard enough when you were just an airbender. And now that there's two benders around him, he is getting wet twice as much. There was a little moment where after the tidal wave uh, sweeps Sokka off of Appa, Appa has this moment where he like pauses and then like looks up at where Sokka got washed away, almost like, wait, where are you going? I was enjoying that. Because <laughs> before he was scrubbing between Appa's toes. Yep. <laughs> One might say that Aang went overboard with the water bending move. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, there's, there's more of those. There's more of those. Don't you worry. Team Avatar journeys into a nearby town to try to replace their supplies that have been lost. Sokka advises to not splurge on needless items as the money that Boomy gave them is almost gone, but it's too late. Aang has already purchased a bison whistle. Uh, so they had three, three copper coin. Now they have two because Aang spent one of them on a bison whistle on an impulse and he blows on it and it seemingly does nothing at the time. Yeah, it's like a dog whistle. You can't hear anything. Right. But like he always like gets super animated when I'm blowing into it. So he does this like large inhale and then exhale and then pretty much nothing. Yeah. And Sokka's bracing himself thinking it's going to be super loud. Yeah. The, the funny thing is too, I don't know if this is a recording thing or not, but I was kind of expecting there to be an actual dog whistle recorded for this. And my dog is because they watched it with me or they were in the room anyways, did not uh -huh. react. So like seemingly nothing happened, even to dogs <laughs> in real what life. What an interesting Easter egg that would be if they had yeah. actually used like, a dog whistle. Like perked up, my dog's perked up or something. But no, yeah. either they're used to a dog whistle, which I don't own, so I don't know how that would happen. Or yeah. there's just nothing there. Ooh, um, real quick. Yeah. Um. So two things. I yes. found out that the port that they found is officially called CD Merchant's Pier. Aptly named. Which... Is aptly named because after seeing all of the the brutish, sketchy people in the streets, I mean, what else could it be named? Also, that one stall that they passed where this guy is like hawking this bag and he's like, are you brave enough to see what's in this bag? Who wants this bag? What do you think was in it? Nothing or poop. Always <laughs> yeah. poop. He was building it up, expecting mm -hmm. to get like 10 gold pieces for a bag of poop. Yep. No. It's probably, it's probably that's what I would imagine it would be because it's like it's easy to make. Well, yeah, assumingly. True. Okay, before we get even more into poop jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, one more thing. I did find it interesting that Aang was able to buy the bison whistle for a copper piece because as we saw in Imprisoned, copper pieces aren't that great because the tax collector dumped them on the ground of the shop. So right. they're probably like, what, pennies or something? They're not I think it's a penny. That that's, valuable. that's my justification, yeah. Yeah, so he bought this bison whistle and i was thinking it might be because it's an unusable relic because all the bison are supposedly gone in the world so it's yep. just like a regular old whistle um but it's interesting because that is what the air nomads use to herd their bison so to ang it's very valuable it's also applicable i found in my research they are the only known instruments capable of calling flying bison from long distances and that they were based on horse whistles Interesting. Yeah, like I wonder if it's almost like um Jack and the Beanstalk kind of situation where you have these magical beans, but no one really believes they're magical. So it seems like a ripoff. As far as everyone knows, air bison don't exist anymore. Airbenders don't exist anymore. Like my my uh, headcanon essentially is people just keep on trying to unload this like whistle, this useless whistle onto other people while still trying to get some of their money back. Yeah. 
So it eventually reaches. Yeah, that's an interesting parallel. Yeah. To Jack and the Beanstalk, or like um, dragon eggs that are thought to be like rocks or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that too. So like, I I would love. I know it doesn't happen, but I would love an episode that just follows an air bison whistle or this one throughout its journey to get the Aang. So I feel like. Oh, that would have been so cool. That would be really. That would have been really cool. So I don't know. Anyways, Aang purchases the air bison whistle. He blows on it. Seemingly nothing happens. Katara suggests it would probably be a better idea if she held on to the money from now on, which for me is a big oof. And like, I can't understand that because I too have purchased an air bison whistle or two in my day. (laughs) So I can relate to that. Um, Or the closest thing. (laughs) Or the closest thing. The group uh, end up walking past a dock ship with a shady looking barker attempting to drum up some business so for those of you who don't know uh the barker is the person outside this is like hey you want a deal i got a deal for you you want this thing one copper like they just literally come up with slogans on the spot they try to get business inside uh i didn't know what that was i was going through um wiki and i saw that i was like is that an actual term or is that just like a weird thing so i looked it up it's an actual term that's what it's called uh, I know that pirate has a name, but I didn't put it in my notes because we didn't learn that name in this episode. Oh, I have it. I don't know if isn't we like, ever find out, honestly. Isn't it like O or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Pirate Barker O. Pirate Barker O asks if Aang would be interested in some curios, to which Aang asks, what is a curio? And O replies, I'm not entirely sure. Let's go find out. <laughs> But he got Aang at the word exotic. He did. He did. <laughs> Ooh, exotic. Exotic curious. I see. Yes. Inside, there are many strange and exotic, there's that word again, items for sale, including a monkey statue with ruby encrusted eyes and like a necklace, which if you were happy about my overboard joke, you're going to love this next sentence. Oh, God. We're going to make a note of the ruby encrusted monkey because... Uh, some might say it'll swing back into our lives a little bit later <laughs> because it does oh tend God. because it does tend to hang around in later wow. episodes. I got the, wow. the double on that one. I can't believe what I'm hearing right now. <laughs> oh my God. It's this quality content that the, that the people are here for in my head. Yes. Yes. In your head. <laughs> we learn the that crowd these... goes wild. <laughs> yes. In my head. <laughs> my dogs are just looking at me unamused. Anyways, we learned that these items were acquired through high-risk trading, or as I like to call it, stealing. And as it's implied... Five-finger discount, right? Definitely, yes. Browsing the store, quote-unquote, Katara happens upon a rack of scrolls, one of which seems to have a water emblem on the handle. Fun fact, I went into a 20-minute just like research binge on what the handle of a scroll is actually called. And I could not find anything. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) So if you know that, please email us or tweet at us, please. (laughs) This is driving me nuts. I couldn't find it. Katara opens the scroll and notices several water bending techniques detailed inside. Katara calls over to Aang and the two admire the scroll as the pirate captain snatches it from the two of them, informing them that the scroll came from up north and was acquired for the low, low price of free 99. I do want to make a note that um, Brian Konetsko does the voice of the pirate Barker. He's O? He's O. <gasps> the captain is played by Jack Angel, uh, who played Sid in Final Fantasy XV, Teddy in the movie AI with Haley Joel Osment, and Papa Whoa. Smurf from the Smurfs movies. That's random. Yeah. He's like um, him and there's a Fire Nation soldier that wasn't named, but uh, Jim Meskimen does the voice. And he also has various roles through Arkham City, Batman versus versus the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and How the Grinch Stole Christmas with Jim Carrey and also the Punisher uh, Thomas Jane movie. So like, oh, my God, they got like uh, just like these very talented uh, actors just pl- that are usually do various roles to come on in and do this. So- I love that detail because um, actually Brian went to school for animation. And so a lot of the art that you find in the art of Avatar is drawn by him. So he was going to school for animation. I'm sure that he has dabbled in some uh, some voice acting mm-hmm. before. 
but that's so cool. Like that's also like probably a dream for him is like not only is this my like child so to speak that I'm putting out into the world but like I get to be a part of this adventure in yes. another way. So that's really cool. Sokka finally puts together that the crew is in fact pirates or as they like to be called high risk traders. Katara asks how much for the water bending scroll but the captain informs them that someone in the Earth Kingdom is willing to pay handsomely for it. A nobleman, I think he said. However. Yeah, I wonder who that is. I don't know. Watch be boomy. <laughs> <laughs> However, the scroll can be theirs right now for 200 gold pieces, not copper pieces for those paying attention. Gold pieces. Oof. Which I assume 100 copper equals one gold in my mind. I, yeah. Or do you think this silver is an intermediate or silver is the in between mm, there? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Aang, in his best pirate impression, tries to haggle with the pirates as they are known to, to do so on occasion and offers one copper piece. So if we're going with my conversion rate in my mind, it's what? One two hundredth of what they're asking for? Yeah. The captain laughs in Aang's face and says, the price is 200 gold pieces. Oh, he says, <clears throat> the price is 200 gold pieces. I don't haggle on rare items or items this rare. <laughs> there you go. You're all welcome. That's more of like a Jeffrey Rush from Pirates, but whatever. Aang, <laughs> Aang tries to offer two copper pieces, but this only angers the captain. All of a sudden, Katara gets a little anxious and asks if they can get a move on because she feels like they are starting to get some weird looks. I we be casting off now, Aang proclaims. I have way too much fun with pirates. Aang proclaims <laughs> as the group leaves the ship. Once they leave the ship, Sokka and Aang ask why Katara wanted to leave so suddenly. Though Katara simply states that she did not feel comfortable on board and will feel a lot better once they get away from the ship. Hey, you, get back here! The barker, well... Oh, here's another one. If you were a fan of swings, hangs, and overboard, you're going to like this. The Barker barks after Team Avatar oh my God. as they walk away. At first, <laughs> I'm, I was great with these notes. At first, Aang quite confidently believes that the pirates now realize their mistake when they didn't want to barter for the waterbending scroll. The Avatar quickly realizes how wrong he is in that assumption as pirates jump into action, brandishing all kinds of different weapons and are ready for a fight. I don't think these pirates are here to trade with us, Katara says, her voice notably shaky, and the team runs away from the pirates giving chase. Note here, mm -hmm. I discovered that the pirate crew was modeled after the friends and colleagues of Brian and Mike at JM Animation. That's really cool. So cool. Uh, specifically, Pirate Barker O., is based on Sung Hyun Oh, a Korean animator who later became the supervising director for season three. Oh, nice. I love those little things. That's so cool. Yeah. During the chase, Sokka and Katara jump through the cabbage merchant's cart, only to knock over, like, between the two of them, it was like three cabbages, and the merchant caught them pretty easily. He was in the clear. He was he in was the clear. Safe. Aang jumps through, sees the cart. Like, he turns around, he sees the cart, and sees it as a great way to try to trip up the pirates um, chasing them. So he airbends and just decimates this poor cabbage merchant's cart. <laughs> and all of the cabbage just go right down the, like, the street to which the cabbage merchant proclaims, This place is worse than Omashu! <laughs> yes. We first see the cabbage man, the cabbage merchant in Omashu, of course. Yeah. And I learned that he was supposed to be a one-off, just a one-off character in that episode. But he quickly became a recurring character because of the writer's love for running gags mm -hmm. and his popularity with fans. Brian and Mike always loved the three old guys who kept popping up on various planets in Cowboy Bebop. So they ran with the idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will make a note that James C. did resume his role as the Cabbage Merchant. Amazing. Amazing. Um, before we move on, I did notice something that was interesting. This whole episode is based on teaching Aang waterbending, mm -hmm. right? 
And by the waterfall, Katara taught him a couple different moves. Well, I noticed when they were running away from the pirates, she bended water onto the ground behind them and turned it to ice so the pirates would slip. Yeah. I distinctly remember she did not teach Aang that trick. Do you think she's holding out on Aang because she had her ego bruised so much that she's like, I'm not going to give him everything I have? No, because so far she's thrown everything at him and hopes it will trip him up. Oh, so she gave him the hard ones. That's what I think she maybe or maybe she just didn't get a chance to do that. That last one, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or maybe she didn't really deem it as an important lesson because it's it's very easy for her. To yeah, because she's done that a couple times now, right? The ice uh, thing. She she bended ice around the Fire Nation soldiers on the ship. Yes. in the first the second episode. Yep. But I always thought it was easier because they were in the Arctic, and it was like. But she didn't bend. I mean, she turned the ice into water. Or the water into ice. Yeah, she did then. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't know. I just thought it was interesting. It was yeah, something it that um, she did without having to think about very much because she's running away from pirates. She's ducking around corners, and yet she was easily able to bend some water onto the ground and then turn it to ice. Yeah. She is a good water bender, despite what she might think of herself or Aang mm-hmm. in this episode. The group of friends are eventually cornered by the pirates and Aang uses his airbending and his glider to help them escape. And the group returns to their camp at the waterfall. Aang reveals that he used to look up to pirates. But the reality of how terrible they are has made him rethink his position on pirates altogether. <laughs> Very fair. I love that line. I know. It's almost like he has this childlike wonder of pirates and he meets him and he's like, yeesh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Never meet your heroes, folks. That, that's the, ooh, no, nope, never mind. I didn't say that yet. <laughs> Katara agrees and reveals that's why she acquired the water bending scroll from them using the high risk trading technique the pirates were bragging about earlier. Again, stealing. That's what they mean. Sokka begins to scold his sister, but Katara interrupts him and states that the pirates most likely stole the scroll from a water bender. Sokka is angry that Katara risked their lives to learn a few new splashes which only further escalates matters as Katara yells about the importance of these real waterbending forms and techniques for Aang's journey. Whatever, Sokka sighs and rolls his eyes as he walks away. What's done is done. We might as well learn from it, Aang tells Katara as the sun begins to set. It is interesting that she justifies the stealing by saying, well, the pirate stole it from a waterbender. And I'm a waterbender, so essentially I'm stealing it back for, like, my people. Yeah. Oh, also, Aang has to learn waterbending, too. So yeah. we're all good. The whole um, underlying theme, and Sokka touches upon this multiple times, is Katara really wants the scroll so she can get another chance to show that she can waterbend better than Aang. Mm-hmm. That's the whole, like, it's a very... it's. It's uncharacteristic of her, but like it is. Yes. At this point, she is kind of questioning her own identity because like I would imagine she thinks, well, I'm the waterbender of the group. Like while the avatar can waterbend, I I wonder if she has like a jack of all trades, master of none mentality when it comes to the avatar, where it's like, obviously, if someone's sole purpose on waterbending is only waterbending, they will be better than someone who can do everything because their focus would be so divided. Uh, And then when this becomes challenged she like her purpose essentially or her uh, perceived purpose is like really at at stake here even though it's not it's just what she thinks so she yeah. she this scroll is super important to her it's very like selfish of her I, th- I think Sokka's right it is very selfish of her to steal this risk everyone's life for this chance even though it is true Aang needs to learn water bending. That's not why she stole it. Yeah, we're going to see more of that in a little bit because I think a lot of this episode is centered around Katara's ego and her her self identity. Um, you're right; it is essentially out of character for her to be selfish and to um, act on her her selfishness. But I think it also makes her a more believable character because this really matters to her. So I love how they included that in her character because otherwise she's good. She's kind, she's caring. 
Um, but so much of her identity, like you said, is wrapped up in her being a waterbender that she's just allowed herself to let that motivate her actions. I do also, I like seeing the side of her too, because for me, the familial bond between her and Sokka is a lot more believable now because like, yeah, I, I would have to assume that this is at some point like nature versus nurture. This is the nurture aspect of like their family. You can see the family resemblance. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Even in the tone, like Mae yeah. Whitman does a great job at like doing a Sokka impression essentially later on. <laughs> yeah. Which I really like. Meanwhile, Zuko and Iroh arrive at CD Merchant's Pier. Much to the prince's frustration, his uncle did not find the replacement White Lotus tile that brought the group here. It's good to know this trip was a complete waste of time, the prince yells. His uncle can only smile and say, quite the contrary. I always say the only thing better than finding something you are looking for is finding something you weren't looking for at a great bargain. Ira Wood. <laughs> I love this so much. Also, relatable. Thank you, Ira. Yes, yes. We see several members of the Fire Nation army walk by with their arms full of trinkets and instruments for music night on the ship. Yes. I never thought I would say this, but I live for Zuko and Iroh going on shopping sprees together. Mm -hmm. What a precious moment. Every moment that we see Zuko and Iroh together and the Avatar is not in sight is always for me the most memorable and precious and just like honest in good moments in the show. Yes. It's really it's purely them. And then when Aang shows up is when Zuko flips the switch and he gets that like <laughs> laser focus. The Avatar. The Avatar. And again, his in my brain, his mind is just the Avatar getting pummeled over and over and over again. Like that's his train of thought right now. <laughs> right. That's his happy place. My honor. <laughs> <laughs> Zuko and Iroh happen upon the same pirate ship where Katara stole the scroll. And Uncle Iroh admires the ruby encrusted monkey statue that we saw earlier. This isn't what I was talking about earlier, but we see it again. Zuko overhears a pirate telling the captain that they lost the little bald monk and the water bending girl. Recognizing the description, Zuko asks for more information to confirm that they are talking about Team Avatar. So he goes, This little bald monk, did he have an arrow on his head at the waterfall? Or the puddle, that's what I like to call it, at the puddle, <laughs> Katara and Aang begin to practice water bending with the new techniques. One of the first techniques they try is the water whip, a simple technique where water is formed into an elongated shape and snapped at the target. When Katara attempts the new technique, she not only whips herself, but then also Momo afterwards. <laughs> Poor Momo. Kata Poor Momo. Katara's frustrations only grow when Aang plays the role of the teacher now and explains how to shift her weight through the stances and succeeds after his first attempt at the water whip oof yes poor katara yes like you, you, that's that's a blow to the ego she can't contain it anymore right so like i say she's really channeling her inner Sokka now and explodes into an angry rant and insults Aang by saying that his infinite wisdom gets old sometimes. Maybe we don't need this stupid scroll since you're so good at this. Like all these things. Ouch. We see Aang's eyes just start to like well up and fill with tears. Katara sees this and realizes what her outburst has done. She apologizes to her friend and to Momo for whipping him. Uh, regretting her actions, she gives the scroll to Aang, saying she wants nothing to do with it. Yeah, that goes back to to what we were talking about before, about how she lets her her jealousy and her ego get in the way of things. But what she doesn't seem to realize is there's a huge difference between learning how to bend for the very first time and learning a second style of bending. Because Aang, as an established airbender, he's already mastered the basics, mm -hmm. like form, stance, etc., uh, from his own practice of airbending, while Katara is learning everything from the ground up. It's kind of like someone who's new to dancing, learning how to dance for the first time, because not only is she learning the moves, but she's also learning how to move her body. And that's difficult. He must have a leg up on this situation because he can airbend and he's great. Like he's a master of it. So one would assume that while it's there are different forms of bending, a lot of the principles still stand true. Like breathing comes to mind like how to kind of like channel your your breath to kind yeah. of make it more 
I don't know, streamlined or easier for you. And how to flow through stances yes. because the illustrations of the water bending scroll I found are based on the 24 step form of Tai Chi, ah. which is the martial art that water bending is based on. So Tai Chi is very much about flowing with the body, with the form. It's very uh, liquid. Mm -hmm. Is there an yeah, attitude for that? Liquid. <laughs> Don't think I didn't catch what? that. What? You said it's very liquid when we're talking about Tai Chi and we're talking about water bending. Yes. It's another yes. pun. Now you're getting in on it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Tai Chi is very fluid. It's all about uh, almost channeling energy throughout your body using uh, shifting of hips mm -hmm. and moving of movement of arms. She's learning this for the first time versus Aang, who's learned airbending, which is again based on Bagua. So different forms, similar fluidity, mm -hmm. but uh, she's learning everything for the first time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and like you were saying, the water whip, movement that's shown in that scroll is tai chi it's called the single whip posture is what that one was called yes. yeah so cool another thing about this scene is after katar blows up and yells at ang in true kid show fashion she instantly apologizes mm -hmm. takes ownership for her own actions and then tries to make it right by giving the scroll up just a good lesson for everyone when you do something wrong apologize own it and then try to make it right yes Absolutely. I feel like we need some more of that in the world. Meanwhile, Zuko has joined forces with the pirates to hunt down the Avatar. Whenever we talk about Z Zuko and the Avatar, I'm going to say it like that. The Avatar. <laughs> the pirate captain states they should be searching the woods. But Zuko reminds the captain that they stole a water bending scroll so they will be on the water practicing. Smart. I like it. Very smart. Later that night, Katara steals the scroll and slips off into the night to practice the new techniques. Katara's venting and yelling at the water when she was having difficulty picking up these new techniques draws the attention of Zuko and the pirates, and they ambush her and tie her to a tree. Zuko gives Katara an ultimatum, the location of the Avatar, in exchange for the safety of her and her brother. Without missing a beat, Katara tells Zuko to go jump in the river. Zuko tries to appeal to Katara again by telling her that he is only trying to restore his honor. And in exchange for the information, he can restore Katara's necklace to her proper home, which would be on her neck, because it was her mom's that she lost all the way back in episode, what was that? In Imprisoned. Imprisoned, the episode titled Imprisoned. And Katara's kind of like, where did you get that from? And I love this part because Zuko so smugly says, well, I didn't steal it, if that's what you're asking. Implying uh -huh. that he knows that Katara stole the, the uh, scroll and that he's actually a better person than her. Oh, in that implication. so good. It was so and understated. In that whole sequence, he's showing just how smart he is and how many steps ahead of everyone he is because he uses the scroll mm -hmm. as leverage against the pirates mm -hmm. to get them to help him find the avatar. Mm -hmm. He holds Katara's necklace over her head. He throws her some shade in the process saying, well, I didn't steal this. Yeah, oh, it's so good. It's he just more examples of how Zuko is, in fact, very smart, calculated and capable. Except whenever the avatar shows up and then he just fumbles the <laughs> ball. And then he's the just ball. like blind, blind rage. All, all Blinders the time. on. It's so bad. Yeah. Barreling towards blockades, you know, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Just like, just, he's like, doesn't care. He's just tunnel visioned by the whole thing. Yep. The pirate grows impatient because Katara is not even taking that bait essentially and demands the scroll be returned to them immediately. Zuko uses the scroll as collateral and threatens to destroy it by firebending underneath it. And he's kind of like, I wonder how much this would go for, how much this costs. The pirates react and he goes, ah, I'm guessing this is expensive. So again, like doing something like that, he knows they want it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how badly that they want it. Now he knows. Now he can force the pirates to search for Aang for him. Aang and Sokka wake up the next morning to find both Katara and the scroll missing. Before Sokka can finish his sentence about how her actions will get them in trouble, her actions get them in trouble as the pirates <laughs> ambush the two friends. Sokka quickly jumps into action while Aang fails to airbend a net away and is 
quickly captured. As Aang is dragged away from the pirates, the pirate who is battling Sokka just stops and follows his buddy who's got the avatar. <laughs> and Sokka's like, what, am I not good enough to kidnap? <laughs> Which results in Sokka getting kidnapped. So I guess he is good enough to kidnap. So good. Team Avatar is reunited as Katara apologizes and accepts full responsibility for the predicament they are all in. It's not your fault, Aang reassures his friend. No, it kind of is, Iroh states. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. He didn't have so to say anything. Too. And he's just like, no, no, no. This is your fault here. It's fine. Yeah, it kind of is your fault. Yeah. <laughs> like just deadpan from Iroh. But like also, like also Iroh, Loki trying to teach like a little lesson in there to someone he doesn't even yes. really know, which is awesome. Sokka jumps into action with his best weapon, his mouth, and tells the pirates that Aang is the avatar and that he will fetch them a much better price then some stupid scroll, Zuko and Aang, tell Sokka to stop it. So you know he's onto something good there. But he continues to paint a picture of being set for life with how much the Fire Lord will pay them for Aang's capture and reward them. The pirates tell the prince to keep the scroll. They can buy hundreds of them for what they'll get for the Avatar. And they try to walk off with Aang. I could see that being played two ways. Either Sokka being kind of the blabbermouth that he is, just says, wait, are you really going to trade him for a piece of parchment? No. Or like the avatar for was, a piece of parchment? Do you think it was calculated the whole time? I think time? it was calculated. So like if you look at when he is talking, like so like he says that, right? And he's in their capture. So like I think they're holding on to him or they have him within their mm -hmm. grasp. And suddenly he's like flowing like genie from Aladdin in between the pirates saying these things. In the second scene, yes. Yes. When he like sidles over and is like, yeah, the avatar. Exactly. Like suggestive, suggestive. But the first one, the first line, when he was like almost incredulous. No, I think, saying, I think it was are all. Are you really? I think it was all on purpose. Okay. I think says. So I could see it being either way. Sokka is, I mean, I'm obviously everyone knows I'm very biased. And whenever Sokka is shining through, <laughs> I'm going to say he's yes. shining through even if I have to like warp my reality around that to make it happen. But oh like, God. but like in my mind, it's like the con artist in him. Cause it's just kind of like, okay, yeah, here's what we're going to do. Like, cause he is a very smooth talker when he wants to be. Yeah. So I, to me, it's all just like part of the plan. It's a last ditch effort. Like just, I mean, it's a strategy is just show all your cards and see what happens. Yeah. And that's what he did right here. Yeah. And so, I mean, if it was intentional, He's obviously a variable that Zugo wasn't anticipating in his plan because yeah. by playing that angle, he was able to get them away from Zuko and away from the Fire Nation soldiers. Mm -hmm. And soon we see that they're actually protecting him in Aang from the Fire Nation soldiers. So I think it works out pretty well if it was his master plan all along. Yeah. And again, you, you kind of see like Zuko's blind rage starting to take like effect or not blind rage at this point, but like his blinders are definitely thrown up because he could have very easily countered that argument with saying like, yeah, where do you think I'm going to bring the avatar? I'm going to make sure that you guys are paid handsomely. That's why he's coming with me. It's going to be the best way to get to the fire Lord. Right. But also the pirate. That would have been good. Yeah. But he's just so like, and like maybe he would have thought of that if he could keep like a, like a calm mind, but he can't whenever the avatar is yeah. within his grasp. He, this has happened two or three times before or maybe two times before where he's had the avatar on his ship in his hands and he slips away this is happening again mm -hmm. he does not want it to happen the pressure is really on he can't tell his dad that he lost the avatar again even though he hasn't really probably told him about the first times but this is probably what his thought process is yeah so he instantly gets defensive and tries to like apply brute force yes yeah he like literally he attacks the pirates he's like you're not giving to me fine i'm gonna yep. burn through you <laughs> yep which allows team avatar to use this as a distraction to steal the water bending scroll back escape to the pirate ship where katara is trying to push it with her bare hands back into the water it's a <laughs> large ship it's not like it's a quite robo. large it's big so like I don't understand what she was thinking. Eventually, Katara and Aang come to the realization that they can waterbend together and get the ship back in the water. That whole fight scene was so well choreographed. It was. It was so good to watch. I also really liked it because I didn't have to take a lot of notes on it. There were a lot of things that happened oh in gosh. it. 
it's a true it's a long one and it's great you have the water bending scroll is like we're following it a little bit as it's kind of like going from pirate to firebender to the pirates to momo well it we went to, to who was that iguana before? parrot iguana parrot thank you yeah it's just going all over the place we're kind of following it and we're getting snippets of this fight there's a scene that's really funny where Sokka is looking for ang and ang's like i'm in here he's like where and he pushes all of the smoke out and he sees he's surrounded yep. by his enemies ang is surrounded <laughs> by everyone and then pushes it all back in and he's just like Never mind. I'll come to you. <laughs> yep. It's so good. There's so that many. May, that may have been one of the best scenes in this episode. I love those moments in anything where it's like action, 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 pause, reveal everything, comedic moment. Okay, go ahead. Action, 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 action. It's a very yes, like Jackie Chan esque kind of uh, styling, which I yeah. love Jackie Chan, like at like movies and like his martial arts style where it's like he punches someone and his hand hurts brilliant yep. it's all good <laughs> iroh interrupts the fight between zuko and the pirate captain and says are you so busy fighting you cannot see your own ship has set sail zuko informs his uncle that this is no time for a proverbs <laughs> but iroh points out that this is no proverb and the pirate's ship has been stolen zuko laughs side note this is the first time we have ever seen zuko laugh and he only laughs twice in the whole show. In the whole show. Because he's too busy being angry he's, otherwise. He's too busy just being Zuko. Yeah. So he laughs as the captain runs off after his stolen vessel, only to have his laughter cut short when he sees the pirates that have, uh, when he sees the same pirates have stolen the smaller Fire Nation steamboat that he was on or that he had. This is also another side note. This is the second time we've seen something censored out where one of the pirates is like trying to moon uh, yeah. Zuko as they He's go by. He's about to moon about Zuko to moon and Iroh. Yep. <laughs> I also love the uh, bleeding hog monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> Iroh scratches his chin and wonders out loud, maybe it should be a proverb. So I think we just saw Iroh <laughs> create a proverb on the spot. He did. He filed it away. Team Avatar battles the pirates aboard the pirate ship with Katara successfully performing the water whip. Hey! Yay! However, the ship is fast approaching a waterfall, so the team needs to act fast. We have this like Indiana Jones moment where O, so the the pirate Parker, takes out a knife and does like little knife things with it while approaching Ang. Uh, but the young Airbender takes out his bison whistle and blows on it, and it's like this really animated, really exaggerated. Nothing happens immediately. Yes. <laughs> What it does do, though, is it distracts O enough so that Sokka can take him out and throws him overboard. Aang and Katara manage to use water bending to stop the ship, but the pirates ram into it with Zuko's boat, so the, the steamboat from the Fire Nation, sending them falling over. Suddenly, Appa, who heard the bison whistle, appears and catches them, saving them from plummeting to their death. Back on shore, Iroh starts to chuckle to himself as he realizes, hey, Zuko, guess what? The white lotus <laughs> tile was simply tucked away in his sleeve this entire time. Iroh takes it out and to show his nephew, and Zuko snatches it and hurls it over the waterfall, which hits one of the pirates below. That's where, if this was a sitcom, it would that would be the end of the episode. Yeah. Cue the laugh track yep. and then cut to credits. Oh, yeah. 100%. I also want to remind everyone that the ship that went over the waterfall was the pirate ship that Team Avatar visited earlier in CD Merchant's Pier. Yes. So all of that stolen merchandise is probably either waterlogged, lost, or broken. Not the gem-encrusted monkey. Oh, no. Not that. Not that. It's my favorite. <laughs> Flying away on Appa. Katara gives Aang a heartfelt apology and acknowledges that her actions were fueled by jealousy. Besides, who needs that stupid scroll anyways, Katara states as her friend accepts her apology. Sokka lets out a very Sokka-y smirk and reveals that during the chaos, he was able to take back the scroll. He asks, what'd you learn? You can have this, but you gotta tell me what lesson did you learn? Katara says... We're not going to steal anymore unless it's from pirates. Dun, 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 dun. As Appa flies away, Ang and Katara laugh. 
The end. The end. I really enjoyed this episode. Oh, I loved this episode. So I think it was the perfect episode after a really serious one like the Winter Solstice. Yeah. Two parter. Yeah. Because we we got our our trajectory, right? We got our mission. We know what we what we have to do, what's at stake. Uh Aang's really freaked out about it, but it's still gonna be a fun journey. Yeah, like this is these little episodes, even though they are kind of um, just like little little side episodes, little like throwaways, right? They're they're filler, but yeah, there are little aspects in there that will come into play later that are very subtle. But like you know, it's one of the things you watch on Mall, you're rewarded. Yeah, I have a couple fun facts. Oh yes, I want to hear the fun facts, please. Yes. So the move on the top of the scroll, the water bending scroll is the same move that Paku, the waterbender in the opening of the show, demonstrates. Hmm. That's a fun fact. Interesting. Uh, I have a fun fact. Let's hear it. That I almost forgot about and I made a note of, so I wouldn't forget, and then I almost did again. So we have Zuko fighting pirates in this episode, right? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Who voices Zuko? Dante Bosco. And what is Dante Bosco also known for? Rufio. And who does Rufio fight in the movie Hook? Pirates. There we go. Specifically Captain Hook. Yes. <laughs> That's actually really funny because Zuko fights the captain one-on-one -on -one in this episode. Yes, he does. So, so uh, that's perfect. I wonder if that was a nod. I don't know. Mike, it, Brian, see what you're doing. Let us know. Remember, you can always email at us at avatarthepodcast at gmail.com or tweet at us at podcast avatar. <laughs> I know you're listening. Also, yes. this is the first episode where we see Aang waterbending outside of the Avatar state. Not to say he hasn't done it in between episodes, because I imagine, from what I saw, he was pretty comfortable. It looked like he'd messed around a little bit and like tried some waterbending moves, and then Katara teaches him further. But this is the first time we see him on screen waterbend outside of the Avatar state, so I thought that was cool. I would imagine that, like off screen he just like plays with bubbles and like bends them around <laughs> like i can totally well, see yeah that. because of that one scene in 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 prison where he's like shooting air, at the butterfly like, air puffs at the butterfly yeah, that's literally what i see is that, like maybe he like gets two bubbles and then bends them around like the stress balls yeah like that's what yeah, i can say like, palming yeah water balls or something yes yes all right with all that being said let's talk about who the mvp is so i know i gotta know acorn after all of this talk through the episode, yes, who shines through for you? Who is my MVP? Who is your MVP? My MVP is Appa. Oh, you have the interesting yes. one now. Why? Because, think about it. Appa, aside from being the MVP every episode, because he's the one they're flying on across the country, mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, he also saved them at the end of the episode. If Appa hadn't been there, they would have plunged to their potential deaths at the base of the waterfall. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. And then the end. Show over. Yeah. No more mission. That's we true. fail. <laughs> How about yours? Mine is going to be no surprise. It's kind of a tie, but like, I think if I have to really choose one, it's going to be Uncle Iroh. Okay. Because you cannot convince me that it, it is a coincidence that Uncle Iroh, who we know has this like drunken master, like goofball kind of thing, but is always on top of the ball, just chose this random port arbitrarily to stop at because he lost the tile that he didn't actually lose. Uh huh. I think he knew that the avatar was there or in that area. Oh my gosh. And he knew his nephew was going to sail by it. So he tells the captain to go here. You can't convince mm. me that this is all a coincidence. It has to be part of the plan. I don't think I want to convince you. Uh, I and, think I agree with you. And also, I don't, I think, I think he's torn if you really read into it because he directs it with that train of thought. He directs everyone to this random CD port that no one would ever yeah. stop at normally, like for anything but then doesn't help his nephew in capturing the avatar. He just kind of sits. He sits in the, uh, like off 
The only time he interferes is when the sh- they're getting away. When the ship is sailing away. Right. Yeah. Ah, huh. is he like playing the role of uh, the bumpers on a at a bowling alley? He's like steering the bowling ball that is Zuko down the path. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a, trying to go. That's a great way to put it. Intervening I, only every once in a while. I think he's trying to teach him a lesson that isn't very obvious to anyone, including myself at this point. But I think it's kind of mm-hmm. like, a, like, you know, don't. I don't know what lesson it is, but there can't be a reason why he brings them there and then doesn't help and watches them sail off. Yeah. Only to reveal later that he had the piece the whole time. It's very interesting. Also, yeah. um, Sokka gets a, a notable shout out for me as well. My two favorites. Um, <laughs> Sokka kept a pretty cool head about everything. Um, he was trying, he for once was not in the wrong in the episode. Yeah. And he was trying to convince his sister that like, you know, you are in the wrong for stealing that. Even though you stole it from thieves, it's still stealing. Two wrongs don't make a right, but sometimes they make right. a left. Da, 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 da. <laughs> no, you're right. Sokka's a pretty upstanding character this episode. He supports the team by scrubbing Abba's feet. He imparts his wisdom and advice on how stealing is wrong. Yep. And what did he do at the end? He had the scroll the whole time. And he took the scroll back. Yeah. Yes. You got it back. Yes. Sokka. Sokka. My two favorites really shining through on this one. <laughs> Moving on. What would you say the moral of the episode is? I'm going to have a pretty obvious moral. Yeah. I bet you it's going to be mine too. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Stealing is wrong. Unless it's from pirates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's also that's Beautiful. the very clear moral of the episode. <laughs> uh, also, never underestimate the importance of the White Lotus piece. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Cue suspenseful music. Bomb, bomb, bomb. That's not suspenseful. That's just me saying bomb. But anyways. We also uh, wanted to make a little bit of a note here that you could also argue that um, looks can be deceiving on things for a moral. Yes. And this is not the first time this moral has come up. We talked about this um, on the uh, King, the King of Amashu episode where that was the big moral, but it has come into play quite a few times, uh, most notably with um, the Heibai spirit. And it's seeming to be a yes. monster. So we're seeing this like overarching moral of the season, if you will. Mm-hmm. So Looks can be deceiving. They can always be deceiving. And with that, that's going to be all of the time that we have for this week. We want to take just another moment to thank everyone for continuing to join us through our discussions and for all the love and support that's been shown, uh, not only on Twitter, but through email uh, and throughout the world and throughout different methods and means. Remember, if you want to support the show, the best way to do so right now is to tell your friends about the show and to leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts along with a written review. And as a reminder, I'm just going to remind everyone of this all the time. You give me a five-star review, we're going to read it on the show. And by yes. me, I mean us. You give us a five-star review, it's going to be read on the show. So yes, please <laughs> do it so we can read it. We love to do it. And that's the same for anyone who tweets at us at podcast avatar. And also remember, email us avatar, the podcast at gmail.com. And if you're caught up on all the episodes and want to hang out a little bit more, you can always join me over at twitch.tv forward slash booster Greg. Uh, we're live every Monday and Friday night at 8 30 PM Eastern standard time. So come on in, join the fun. It's always a good time. And you can find me, Acorn, on Twitter at Acorn Bandit and online at joysons.com where I create enamel pins. And remember, we now have an Avatar the Podcast enamel pin. Mm-hmm. Check it out. Do it. Oh, yeah. I'm on I'm on Twitter, too, at Booster Greg. Just pretty much type in Booster Greg anywhere and you will probably get to me. I'm just going to say you're going to yes. get to me. Anyways, next time on Avatar the Podcast. Do leaders run on instinct? And how not to mix up jelly candy and blasting jelly. 
All this and more next episode on Avatar, Avatar the, the podcast. podcast. podcast is a proud part of the geek generation network check out all of our podcasts at thegeekgeneration.com <laughs>